Welcome to another edition of the Law and Gospel Devotional. My name is Eric Sorensen, and each week we gather with you to look at God's two words, both his word of law, which tells us everything we ought to do and points out the many ways in which we have not done it, and most importantly, his word of gospel, which ultimately tells us all that God has done for us and our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, once again, we're going to be looking at one of the upcoming series of lectionary texts for this fifth Sunday in Epiphany that will be coming up on February 4th. Uh, the gospel text for this week is found in Mark verses, chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. And it's when Jesus' ministry is just starting to become known amongst the people of Galilee. And that doesn't come without uh, a little bit of controversy because, of course, he's exercising demons and he's healing people. And he will ultimately preach in what appears to be his hometown synagogue and be rejected. Now, Mark does not go nearly as thorough in his depiction of those events as Luke or Matthew do. But nevertheless, he does recount them. If you will recall, if you've spent any time in the Gospel of Mark, you know that it's the shortest gospel by quite a stretch. And one of the reasons it's so short is because Mark is uh, a man of action. You will find the most common word in the Gospel of Mark is the word immediately. Or maybe if it's not the most common, it's one of these words that is thematic. It's just constantly happening. And the reason why is because Mark seems to be in a hurry to report all that Jesus did. And so that's the passage. But the big idea of that passage, if there was going to be any, it is that, that Jesus indeed has the power as he starts his ministry over all principalities and powers. He, he, is, he is ruling the demonic realm, as we talked about in last week's devotion. He is ruling over sickness. And yes, he is the word made flesh as he comes into his hometown synagogue and proclaims the word of the Lord. So yes, he is the one that crushes the head of the serpent. But the Old Testament reading for this week comes from Isaiah chapter 40. Now again, there's a little bit of background that you need to know about Isaiah 40. Uh, for starters, many scholars have actually posited that Isaiah is not one book, but two books. And the reason why is because the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are markedly different than the last 27 chapters of Isaiah. Remember, there's 66 chapters on Isaiah. And beginning at chapter 40, suddenly the tone that God has towards his people shifts. Uh, primarily for the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, you have God calling out judgment against his people for all of their sins. And he's describing to them what's going to happen as a result of their sin. Indeed, by the time Isaiah 40 is written, God's people are in exile. And so, uh, it's kind of shocking if you were to go back to chapter 39, you would expect that what's coming next in chapter 40 is sort of the ultimate final word of judgment, doom, and gloom for the people of God. And yet, Isaiah 40 goes on to proclaim comfort to God's people in the midst of exile. The chapter begins with the words, comfort, comfort, my people. Well, we're not starting at the beginning, but we're starting at verses 21 and ending at verse 31. And the reason we're going to do that uh, today is because, again, that's the lectionary passage for this upcoming Sunday. But also, it's going to give us a, a picture of why the people of God can trust God to bring about his promises to them, that he actually will bring comfort to them, that he he's going to remind them that even in the midst of their struggles and difficulties, that he is still with them, even if they feel like maybe he's not. And that's the big idea of the passage. Isaiah's reminder is that God is not absent in the suffering, though it often feels like it. One of my favorite movies, really of all time, is, is the movie Signs with Mel Gibson, Joaquin Phoenix, and a slew of other actors. But if you've seen that movie, you know that Mel Gibson plays a former, I believe, Episcopal priest who goes through terrible tragedy in his life. And because of this terrible tragedy, he ends up losing his faith, uh, or at least is wrestling with his faith quite a bit. And if he talks to other people who ask him, he will say that he's lost his faith, that he no longer believes, you know, that he, he no longer knows whether it's true or not. 
Uh, and and yet at the end of the movie, and I will not give any way give away any spoilers, even though I think the movie is probably like twenty years old now. Um, at the end of the movie, we come to see through a series of signs that, in fact, as alone and as abandoned as Mel Gibson's character felt, it turns out that he was never alone, and that God was working all things for good behind the scenes in a mysterious way that they could have never known. Well, of course, the same is true for his people. The same is true for his Christians always, that God is always working even when it feels like he's completely silent or completely absent. And there's no more, uh, there's no more case where that's more obvious in the movie Signs than at the end when Mel Gibson says the words, swing away, Meryl. And I won't give away anything more than that. You just have to see the movie. It's really, really well done. So, all right, what does Isaiah 40 say? Well, it says this in verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? So God begins through the prophet Isaiah asking some rhetorical questions to the people. Have you not heard? Did I Have I not told you always, my people, that I'm going to be with you always? Have I not told you that I'm going to take care of you, that I have you in the palm of my hand? Have I not said this over and over and over again? Indeed, he has. You go all throughout the Old Testament, and you find not just God saying these things, but God proving these things over and over and over again through various miracles, whether it be the miracles that the prophets perform, like Elijah and Elisha, or the miracles that Moses performed on behalf of God's people, and I should say more accurately that God performed through the hand of Moses. But it's abundantly clear that the people, although hearing, didn't have ears to really hear what he was saying and found themselves really struggling to believe it as they are in exile and wondering if they're ever going to get back home. And so God gives them a sort of challenge, a challenge to remember what it is they've heard and what it is they've seen. Verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. By the way, side note, Anybody who tells you that the Bible teaches that there was a flat earth in the Old Testament? Nonsense. Isaiah 40, verse 22. Thank you very much. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Now here, of course, God is calling them to remember that no matter how powerful an earthly ruler feels or a nation feels against his people, no matter how insurmountable the problem might seem, always and without exception, God brings that ruler, that entity, that problem to nothing. But here's the hard part, in his time. And yet, when you consider how often this happens and how quickly this happens in the scope of all of human history, it really is pretty quick. I mean, you know, there's times where throughout world history you have such powerful rulers that seem like they could never die, that seem like they could never be replaced, that seems like there's nothing that can be done to defeat them. In the last century, it was people like Chairman Mao in China or Stalin or Pol Pot or Adolf Hitler. You name it, we can go down the list of tyrants and dictators. And where are they all now? They are all dead. And it really wasn't a long time in the space of the history of the world for them to be taken out of power. That's what God is reminding them of here. Yes, I know it seems like you are under the foot of somebody that has power that you don't know what to do with, but remember who I am. Remember who I am. He continues on, verse 25. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. So what is God calling his people to remember? He's calling his people to remember that he rules 
And he doesn't just rule over the big stuff, but even the most minute stuff. Like Jesus says in the New Testament, not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father's will, that every hair on your head is numbered. And if he cares for us like that, then it really doesn't make any sense for us to be anxious or to worry about whether God is on the throne and whether God is active in our lives, whether God is with us. And yet, of course, because we are still in this body, we're still in the flesh, and we still deal with all sorts of problems in our lives, we find ourselves doing the same thing that the people of God did in the Old Testament all the time. As we go through struggle and difficulty and challenge, we find ourselves wondering at a certain point, where is God and what is he doing? And it's important during those times to hear words like this from Isaiah again so that we can be shored up in what we actually believe to be true about the nature of the universe. God wins. He's winning now. Isaiah continues with his plea for the people of God to remember who their God is. Verse 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So not only does God see his people's plight, but he will not run out of energy to work on his people's behalf to one day bring an end to their plight. Now, of course, this is most specifically seen in the person and work of Jesus Christ who goes all the way to the cross, suffers, bleeds, is humiliated, and is mocked until death for the salvation of sinners. That's how, uh, that's how uh, determined our God is to show us, to show the world that he understands all that we go through, yes, even the most torturous of deaths. But yet the people of God have convinced themselves, in spite of God never running out of energy, that God doesn't see. And that's never true. He continues, verse 29, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. What's the point? God will finish what he has started. God will give us the strength to endure. As the Apostle Paul says, under the mighty strain of persecution and challenge from all sides of his life, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And yet it's very important to recognize it's not us. It's not based on what we do. It's not based on our strength. After all, no matter who we are, no matter how great a shape we are, we do get exhausted. We do faint. We do struggle. We are not able to keep up the fight. We're not able to keep up the battle, but we need the Father to give us the strength to get through the rest of our days. Uh, one of my favorite illustrations of this is something I've mentioned in these uh, little video devotionals a few times, and that's the story of Rick and Dick Hoyt, who did triathlons together. Now, of course, Rick Hoyt could not really do a triathlon on his own at all because he was functionally paralyzed, and was unable to really take care of himself at all. And so it was dependent on the strength entirely of the father to get them through the tri triathlon. So Dick Hoyt would drag him or put him on his back and swim all the length that he needed to swim. And then for the running portion, he would uh, run with his son in his wheelchair uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And so this is, and for the biking portion, he'd have his son in his back. You know, it, it was really a remarkable picture of what God promises to do for his people. That even if it feels like we can't move, that we can't produce, that we can't contribute, because functionally we really don't, he is the one that will bring us to the finish line. He is the one that will cause us to run and not grow weary and to walk and not faint. So that's the passage from Isaiah. It's just an important reminder to the people of God when you're struggling and when you look around and feel like God is silent and is absent, when you're experiencing what Luther calls the theology of the cross, that it's then God is actually doing his greatest work in us. 
Yes, it's true. I know we look for the mountaintop experiences with God, and that's all fine and good if you have them. But the reality is most of the time, uh, maybe not most of the time, but a lot of the time, (laughs) it's not going to feel like that. And sometimes it's going to feel like he's just abandoned us. But don't you believe it for a second. Believe his promises to you are true, even in the deepest valleys of despair. So does this passage have any law at all? Because after all, this is the law and gospel devotional, and it seems like we just read 10 verses of nothing but pure encouragement. Well, you know the answer to that uh, if you've watched any of these videos before. And the answer is, is, of course, there is. There's always both words throughout all of the scriptures. Because remember, the whole reason the people are in exile in the first place is, in fact, because of their sin and unbelief. And so that already is an evidence of the law's work in their life and their inability to keeping uh, to keep it bringing terrible consequences upon them when they're in exile. And so the people have fallen into the trap of believing their plight is hidden from God as a result of this. And God is here to say, no, no, no. The gospel comes in, swoops in and says, God in his mercy and grace promises to renew them and bring them new life out of their exile in spite of their rebellion. So you say, well, what are the requirements for one to receive that same kind of mercy, Eric? If he's willing to do that for the people of Israel, that we can read about being so rebellious and so broken and so unfaithful. Well, I'm going to tell you it's different than what you might expect. As far as I can tell from Scripture, the requirements for being receptors or receptacles of the mercy and grace of God is that, well, we ought to recognize our own passivity in the process. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come, come to me all you are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. The, the words there, you know, could be translated, well, be, be faint. <laughs> like be, be basically unable to do anything. Uh, be, be tired. <laughs> uh, have no might is also what Jesus implies in Matthew 5, 3 through 5. I mean, remember, he says, blessed are the poor and blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness and blessed are those who are persecuted. It doesn't seem like anybody that has much might is included in that list. And then, and then of course, we're told in Exodus 14, 14, that we are called to just wait. Uh, one, one of my favorite, ver- or that's one of my favorite passages where God over and over again tells his people, even as they're coming up against great struggle, wait on me. Moses in that passage, I mean, they're about to cross the Red Sea and the people are terrified and the people accuse Moses of bringing them out to the Red Sea just so they can be uh, eventually captured again by the Egyptians and killed. And then what, of course, happens? Moses holds out his staff, slams onto the ground and the Red Sea parts and a new way is open that the people could have never seen. But before that happens, Moses gives them a promise speaking on behalf of God and says, all you need to do is wait and be silent. Again, passivity. Yes, to receive grace and mercy from our God, we must recognize that we have nothing to contribute, but that He has all we have. We, we all. He has all we need, and He gives it abundantly. Let me close with my favorite passage from all of Scripture: Romans five six through ten. For while we were still weak, not after we fixed ourselves up. But while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one scarcely will die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still a hot mess and couldn't do anything to help ourselves, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And yet notice, folks, the qualifications for receiving such glorious mercy and grace. It's weakness. It's acknowledging our sinfulness. It's acknowledging our need before a holy God. Indeed, that's what God is after with the people of Israel in Isaiah 40, verses 21 through 31. And that's what he's after each and every day for us. 
So I hope that encourages you, especially if you're going through a dark time or you're going through some suffering. Don't give up. Know that your God is for you, that he's with you, and that he will finish the work that he's begun in you, no matter how it feels at any given moment. That is this week's Long Gospel Devotional. May God richly bless you.